Good evening to everyone. Welcome to the Institute for Human Sciences. Uh, as you know from the announcement, this evening we are going to have a debate around uh, this book, Citizens of Nowhere, and the fact that the German translation has just appeared at uh, Zurkamp Verlag, and that's the reason that uh, uh, our, one of our two co-authors of the book uh, is traveling around and doing the launch and has come to Vienna. Uh, Nicolò Milanese, who had a slight uh, traveling uh, mishap uh, and a sprained ankle. Um, but we have managed to uh, find a solution for him to come here and of course very grateful that he has not been impeded um, to come here and, and talk. And uh, we are very happy and honored to have uh, Ulrike Lunacek with us, who will uh, comment on the book and the uh, themes and issues in it. Uh, Ulrike, uh, as you know, was this one of the vice presidents of the European Parliament, a prominent uh, politician and leader of the Green Party here and who also uh, was uh, a fellow for part of the year with us last year. Um, and this whole event is also part of the Europe's Futures project, which is part of our strategic partnership with um, the Erste uh, Stiftung here uh, in Vienna. We have a, a number of events, in fact, uh, and I think one of the reasons uh, for this number of events on European issues. Uh, next week, um, on Tuesday, we will have a presentation of the European Council on Foreign Relations uh, public opinion poll on attitudes of, European, um, of Europeans on how they see Europe and, and its challenges. We have an event on Monday evening. Uh, Luisa Vialashevic is uh, moderating a panel with our own Ivan Krestev on geopolitics, etc. So um, no lack of themes, no lack of, of big problems and challenges that, that Europe has and its individual countries. And uh, we're very happy that uh, Nicolò and his co-author Lorenzo Marsili, who is not with us here today, had uh, approached us with this idea of uh, having this this event so thank you once again for coming this is being live streamed uh, to you know the world and the outer planets um, but it's also on youtube for those of you who want to uh, watch once again it is possible but also of course for those who are not here i think it's a great uh, way uh, in which uh, people who are not in vienna can actually see it. So I will now take my seat and will ask um, Nicolò to give us his uh, introduction and uh, describe what this whole uh, venture was about. Uh, I will only say that um, at some event uh, a couple of weeks ago, somebody made this distinction that is now being used of citizens of nowhere or somewhere or anywhere, uh, talking about uh, individual nation states. He made this difference between those who travel and those who don't travel. So this is a, just a tiny addition to the many ways in which we can describe uh, the people who are in our society. So having said that, and since uh, Nicole is someone who travels, <laughs> uh, I will give him the floor and then we'll launch the evening. But there's a little addition which I will tell you about after our two speakers have spoken. Okay, thanks very much, Ivan. Thanks, uh, Ulrika, for, for being here to discuss with me. Thank you all. And I have to also thank uh, the team at IWM who helped me get a wheelchair and some crutches after my slight spraining of my ankle uh, on, my way, on my way to the airport in Paris and also to my colleagues who, who pushed the wheelchair to get me here from the, from the hotel. It made me feel at home um, and shows perhaps, it shows perhaps that, um, that changing the European Union is a matter of teamwork and solidarity, uh, which are some of the important things of, of the book, which Ivan already showed you. This is the English language version. It is blue like a blue passport. 
Um, and the German language version uh, I don't have, but it is yellow, pretty much the same yellow as my socks. Um, so you can, you, can choose your, you can choose your color. In the book, um, we try to do, let's say, three things. Uh, one thing is to give a reading of our political predicament in Europe. Uh, I will say more about that. The second thing is to try to tell the story, uh, or several stories, of a decade of activism in European affairs that myself and Lorenzo have been involved in. And the third thing is to try to provide some proposals about what it is we ought to do, or, and, and perhaps most importantly, how it is we ought to try and go about doing it. So I, I will try to briefly sketch these three aspects for you and hopefully interest you enough that you read the book. Um, the title, of course, as you've all understood, comes from the infamous phrase of Theresa May, and she was newly Prime Minister after the vote to quit the European Union in October 2016, the first Conservative Party conference. She said, if you believe you are citizens of the world, you are in fact citizens of nowhere. You haven't even understood what the very word citizenship means. And the conjecture of the book is that in one way, Theresa May is totally wrong, but in another way, she may be right, but not right in the way that she thinks that she is. The way in which we suggest that she is totally wrong um, is in particular where she says you haven't understood what citizenship means. Citizenship, we suggest in the book, has always been a tension between the particular and the universal, between universal aspirations of equality amongst citizens. Not everybody was citizens, of course at all stages of history, but amongst them should be equality, universal aspiration, uh, but particularity that any particular political uh, construction would be in one place or another. And the crucial thing is about how this relationship between particularity and universality is articulated. The nation, we suggest, is one way of doing it. We also suggest that the nation can no longer play this articulation role, and I'll come back to that. Um, but Theresa May, in her statement, seems to just make citizenship a matter of particularity. So this is a way in which we suggest that she is wrong about citizenship. Where we think that she may be secretly right, though, um, is where she says, if you believe you're a citizen of the world, you're actually a citizen of nowhere. We mishear what she says a little um, as saying, perhaps we have all become citizens of the world, but because we haven't invented any democratic agency beyond our borders, we may as well be citizens of nowhere. Until we have invented a way to act as citizens of the world, we have in a certain sense lost our citizenship. And this, of course, is a paradoxical way of thinking of the affair, but I think that um, there's something true about the idea that we've all become citizens of the world. Some people, and Ivan gestured to them, would like to divide populations into citizens of somewhere who are concerned with their immediate locality and citizens of anywhere or citizens of nowhere who may have very few attachments. I personally think that everybody is increasingly aware of the different ways that the world impinges on our locality. People are aware of the complexity of the contemporary world. They're aware that events that happen very far away might have very immediate consequences for us. But the political reactions they have to this new fact may be very divergent. Some people may be very scared at it. Some people might find it exciting and adventurous. Um, but we think it's important to realize that we are living in a very worldly world. The world constantly interrupts us even if we would like to try to stay in a very private space. <clears throat> so this is one way that we uh, understand citizens of nowhere. The second important way we understand citizens of nowhere is to play on the word nowhere, which has an important political meaning when translated to utopia. And the history of utopian thought and the capacity of inventing ideals from a position of nowhere is something that's had a very important role 
throughout not only European history, but arguably world history. And it's a capacity that we think it's very important for European citizens to recover. So that's a few things about the title. The title in German, of course, is perhaps also interesting. The German edition is called Wer Heimat Losen Weltbürger. I'm sorry for the bad pronunciation. But um, those of you that understood what I just said may hear that there is a uh, reference to famous quote of Friedrich Nietzsche in The Gay Science, where he talks about we homeless ones, uh, we who have inherited too much European civilization to have local um, attachments. And he calls famously for people to act as good Europeans. And this shows that this um, question of who, where do we belong, where are we citizens of, is something with a long European history. It's not a recent phenomenon. Nietzsche was already talking about it when thinking about German nationalism. And the book is about how do we position ourselves as European citizens in this uh, moment of um, civilizational change or sense of crisis where um, understanding belonging is, is very difficult. The two substantive middle chapters of the book are about the two key crises of, 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 of the last decade, the financial crisis and the migration crisis, um, which call into question, I'm not going to go into the details, but call into question our capacity as civic agents to influence uh, the world that we uh, find ourselves in um, and call into question in a way that I think is basically unresolvable uh, our notions of belonging and who we are responsible for. Migration crisis, it, to our mind, is um, not really a migration crisis, of course, it's a political, manufactured political crisis, but what the migrant is signifying is this questioning of who are we, and there's no permanent answer to that. Um, the answer has to be that we are willing to constantly um, question and, and, and throw ourselves open to new senses of belonging. Um, that importantly, through those, through those chapters which talk about sense of loss of agency and sense of um, questioning our belonging, we tell the story of how we, uh, two uh, young, 10 years younger, um, uh, activists tried to live and influence um, this Europe that we found ourselves in. Um, and to try to give you a sense of how we did that, Lorenzo and I, now uh, over 10 years ago in 2006, um, started to discuss our frustrations about the situation of, of Europe, of, of politics, and the situation of culture and so on, and thought, what on earth can we do with uh, perhaps good educations, but uh, very limited financial resources? Um, what we decided to do very humbly was to start some conferences in, in London, ask philosophers and artists and poets and others to talk about their utopian idea of Europe. We created something that was bombastically called the London Festival of Europe in, in 2007, which created as much surprise then as it would do now, perhaps more surprise then uh, than, it, than, it, than it would do now. Sufficient surprise that at the opening event, which was Sigmund Bauman giving a, giving a lecture, various ministers and ambassadors came along uh, and were highly surprised that the event was not being organized by the European Commission or the European Parliament, but by two young uh, people talking about their utopian ideals for Europe. Surprised at that and angry that we hadn't reserved any seats for them and they had to sit on the stairs. Um, and this uh, told us a couple of things. One was that um, it was possible on, in European affairs to create a sense of surprise. No one expected Europe, young European citizens to be trying to claim Europe in quite the way that we were doing, uh, particularly in a very political way. Um, perhaps it would be less surprising if it had been, an, let's say, an Erasmus project. Um, to, but we had a very political vision, not necessarily aligned with any party, uh, of, of a European utopia that we were trying to advocate. And young European citizens acting politically um, was something that seemed to be surprising. Um, secondly, we learnt through the experience of this, of this festival that there were many, many other 
young Europeans, and luckily there were many of them in, in London, who wanted precisely this kind of action. And so came to us and said, hey, this is great fun. We have to do this not only in London, but in our cities, from Bologna to Cluj to Sofia to Lisbon. Um, and so the festival developed, and so did the organization. And the organization, European Alternatives, developed because many of those people came to us and said, hey, you guys seem to be active on European affairs. You ought to do something about uh, the Roma being expelled from France, or the situation of media freedom in Italy, or um, the response to the financial crisis, and so on. Um, and we firstly thought, well, there must be other organizations working on those things. Now, there are, um, but they're not typically the sort of things that citizens, as active citizens, can get involved in. And certainly not in the kind of ways that many of the people who were in contact with us wanted to be involved uh, in quite a horizontal, shall we say, fluid way of organizing, which didn't really see any need to create, for example, a British chapter of European alternatives and a French chapter and a Romanian chapter. We didn't want to think about Europe in those ways at all. Um, and so, with this kind of um, group of, of people who wanted to invent a new Europe beyond frontiers, we tried in various ways to influence uh, European affairs, whether it be through running an ECI or lobbying in the parliament or um, lobbying inside the European Central Bank. And we tell some of the stories of our doing that um, in the book. The festival continued. Um, other kinds of activities continued, including something we call Trans-Europa Caravans, which happens before each of the European elections, people traveling in caravans across the continents to talk about European affairs. Um, and so um, we had this experience over 10 years of trying to activate European citizens and sometimes succeeding in activating European citizens, even if the uh, material changes one could speak to in, the, in, in European decision-making are very modest, although not totally, um, not totally absent. We talk about that more as well. But that leads me to the last uh, part of my remarks, which is about how do we go about um, engaging in European affairs, uh, particularly as a young generation. And I think that um, there are perhaps three things to say. One is that this division, which has existed not only in the minds of people who are opposed to the European Union in some way, but also in the minds of many people who work to advance the European Union, between a European level of affairs and a local level of affairs, as if there's a very clear distinction, is largely absent uh, for many of the people who've been involved in European alternatives and the younger generation. European affairs affect our daily lives in very clear ways. Perhaps that has become more clear over 10 years of crisis with Europe on the front pages every day. But people don't want to say, well, I'm getting involved in European affairs and that's something very different from my everyday concerns. Not at all like this. Um, so we try to do Europe in a very material and local way, which of course also has the consequence that we act in this transnational kind of way, um, not seeing the need to uh, divide ourselves into different nationalities. Secondly, though, we're all aware, and it's a constant issue when we think about how to organize ourselves as European citizens, um, that European politics is extremely fragmented. Um, not fragmented in the different decision-making bodies that are involved, if you want to try and influence them, but also fragmented in terms of the way people think and understand Europe across the European Union, different interpretations of Europe. And in a certain way, the crisis has exacerbated quite dramatically these different interpretations and different temporalities of Europe across Europe. Uh, and when you try and get people to work together in a horizontal way, you have to make time uh, and provide the, the means for people to begin to understand each other and understand their um, different ways of approaching Europe. The best way of doing that, we've discovered, is by getting people to work on something practical together, not just discussing about what it is they would like to do, but realizing something together, like organizing a festival, organizing a caravan, organizing a small project together. Then you, can, you, have, you, have, a, you have a common objective and it provides the focus to, um, to bring together your ways of thinking about things. And that brings me to the third and last thing, is that 
Um, the book was written by two of us, Lorenzo Marsili and Niccolò Milanese. Lorenzo is from Rome. I was born in London. There's a question about who is the real Italian, who is the real <laughs> European. Um, but the fact that we work together goes beyond the importance of being able to pose questions about our identities. It's, it's, it's something that was challenging for us uh, as two strong-minded people uh, with different ideas sometimes about exactly what an organization should be doing, concerned about different parts of Europe, um, to work together over 10 years and to try and build something together. Of course, it was not only two of us, there were other people, many other people involved as well. Um, and so it's also a story of political friendship and, shall we say, political commitment over 10 years. And I think that ultimately is the most important story in the book, so it's the one I want to finish with. And I wish, I wish that we had written more about it in the book because um, the question of political friendship and not always seeing exactly eye to eye but seeing a greater importance in working together and opening up to others, um, how to deal with divergence without having to come always to a common view but to leave open the divergence in ways that other people can become involved and recognize themselves, while also not necessarily all having to come to a common view, but share a common action. These questions of um, politically working together, and working together not just for one action for one year, um, but over 10 years in the perspective of building something which other people will become involved in. This, I think, is the crucial skill uh, for all Europeans to recover or to learn for the first time. Um, it's, what, it's what will answer the question how Europe can be saved from itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Nicolo, uh, many, many thoughts and, and questions that I'm sure our audience will, will come back to a number of themes. But before we go there, I'd ask Luna, uh, Ulrike to give her, her comments. First of all, for inviting me to discuss this interesting book with you and, and with the audience. And um, when listening to you and reading not all of the book, but parts of it, I felt that many things uh, resonated in me personally and also politically, professionally, what I've doing, been doing in my life. Because I come from civil society myself, uh, organizing at local level, but then also very much in international affairs, development issues, women's issues, LGBTI issues, which very often not just on Austrian issues, but at European level or even at UN level. Um, and then me personally, then going the way from civil society and NGO politics, negotiating government, lobbying government and organizations, then going to become a politician myself uh, in, in parliament, not in any government, uh, but parliament. So um, some of the thoughts and also look and having been following, following especially European um, evolving of the crisis and how things were dealt with and what was missing in dealing well with them and getting out of the crisis in a, in a way that makes citizens optimistic and not going towards those who want to destroy what, what had been built. Um, so many of the things you said resonated with me and I find what I, what I would find interesting to discuss is not just what you said, the last part, how to how to cooperate with others on this continent. Let's stick to where we are when we talk about that. Uh, knowing how different we are in not just languages, but in cultures, in ways, how we, how we deal with things. How do we, when we meet and are people from different backgrounds, how do we try to find a way from, if we have a problem to solve, we have to make a law or write a text. How do we do that when we are so different and when we have very different views? How do you manage to get something that then in the end everybody can say, yes, that's fine with me? I mean, this I think many of us experience at many levels anyway. But for, and for me, I mean, with all the problems we have, uh, the, the European Union is a way of trying to, to, to do that. And for me, in my experience, in the eight years I've been in the European Parliament, it was really, I mean, I have to say, was the best part of my professional and political life. Although I loved the NGO part, yeah, and I liked the Austrian Parliament, but this way of, of trying to find solutions among people from 28 
state with more with 24 languages um, different also characters and sometimes you feel that the the cliches that we have about certain pe members of certain countries are they are true sometimes they are not but how do we find solutions how do we try to put our own interests a bit back to, in order to try to find something common because none has the majority there so in that sense, I find that what you said at the end, it's maybe starting with that, the issue of the, the, the strong political friendship and commitment, even if you don't share all the common views and, and all everything that's common, but you have a certain um, outlook at, 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 at some, kind, some utopia somewhere, and you have to define what that utopia is or can be. And then how do you get there, which is the more difficult path, I think, yeah? because sometimes it's easy to have a kind of vision, uh, but then the, the path there is difficult, but it's the one which also now is, is essential. Um, and when you started with the issue of, of citizenship, which I also find is a, even now in these election campaign, but, but apart from that is important. I mean, only citizens of EU member states can vote in European elections. They can vote in different countries, in different EU member states, that at least. But uh, even EU citizens who live here in Vienna from other member states cannot vote in national elections here if they're not citizens from here. So this kind of what does citizenship mean nowadays? Or migrants who have been living even from outside of the EU uh, who live here in this country or in Italy or in, in France or in Poland or there are some as well, or in other countries, they are not allowed, even though they have been living for years, for decades in the country, to take part in the democratic system where decisions are taken. Um, so th this issue of that we should have citizenship defined as from where you live and not just in the state you're in, or as a, I mean, as a whole European state or whatever <laughs> we call republic, um, that should be the people who live here, yeah? not just who visit, but the people who, who live here who have their, their, their center of life here. So this kind of, of citizenship is something where I think we see the limits of, of where we stand at the moment and which needs to be changed for in order to make it something inclusive and not as it is now exclusive for, for many who live here. And it's one thing that, and here I think the particular and the universal combines yeah? because it's particular interests of individuals to have a say in, in, in what they are concerned with in the lives they live, what kind of decisions are taken for the health system and the social system and jobs and economy and climate change, whatever. But of course, it is, a, it is something that, um, as you said, we all are citizens of the world, or this kind of thing there. I think it, it's true, but then it has to be defined what this kind of citizenship means. And then the issue, of course, comes, and what does it mean for democracy? There's always talk about there's lack of democracy at EU level. Well, yes, the European Parliament doesn't have full uh, legislative rights, and the Council, which is member states who are executive at home and legislative at Europe, this is something that simply from a um, division of power point of view should be, shouldn't exist. Yeah. But what we do not have, and I think what is part also in, in your book, the idea of how to, how to also close the gap between, the, which I think over the last 10 years, 11 years since the first crisis, the, the economic crisis has become so great, the, the, the sort of the elites who, who seemingly decide everything and citizens, where the populists then build on and say, yeah, sort of feed in the fears and all of that. Really to have more of, of uh, citizens, or a new convention or something like that, I think that will be necessary in the future in order to get some kind of trust again, at least by, by more people than now, in what decisions are taken at, at the political level. Because we probably, and we talked about that before we, before we started here, these changes will not happen from today to tomorrow. They will not happen with these elections. I think we'll, we'll need more time in order, first of all, to frame what really, not everybody, but um, possible majorities want, and then how we get there. Yeah, this will take time. And the third thing I wanted to mention is, I have to say, I, I, like, I like the English title of the book, but I even like the, the German title more. 
Um, because that has to do with the fact that this term Heimat is something that in the German-speaking countries, it's also unique, the term, it's some, a, a term that it's very difficult to translate in other languages. And it also has been abused as, you know, politically during especially Nazi times and by that. So it's very difficult to deal with that. Um, and it's something like I have been feeling it's important to also claim it again from those who, who, who are at the other spectrum, say, on the liberal left part of the democratic spectrum. Because it's something that, that many citizens sort of in the German speaking countries feel especially when it's a very sort of the, the closer uh, Heimat, um, feel something that, that connects them. But it is also, it has been intoxicated and poisoned. This and so I like it that you combine, or that whoever did it, combines it with uh, the sort of citizens of the world without this Heimat. And, uh, okay, and, and one last thing I wanted to, to add, when you said about when you started these European alternatives and these uh, meetings you had and you discussed several issues of like Roma discrimination in member states or um, media freedom in Italy, it came to my mind when I started in the European Parliament in 2009, one of the first issues that uh, we tried to have a, a majority of, of criticizing and of, of looking into media pluralism in a member state was with Italy, with Berlusconi at that time. And it was one of the votes which we lost, I think, by three votes in the European Parliament. Because there were some, how was it, some Portuguese um, conservatives who had left the, the, their cons the European People's Party group and joined the Liberals. And the liberals, of course, were in favor of this criticism of Berlusconi's uh, power of the media. But those three, or like some others, then decided to vote with their former group. And so we lost it. So that was one of my first experiences, how tight votes can be in the European Parliament, which usually doesn't happen, at least not in the Austrian National Parliament. So um, um, yeah, I think there's much more to, to be said, but I, I think what I really like in your book and, and what, you, what you present is this idea of how do those people who are, how those citizens who don't belong to a political party, who, who, have, but who, who have an idea of, they, they, they know that things need to change in order to make what many of us feel is what being European or being a citizen of the world should mean for societies to make that work, uh, because we're far away from that at the moment. So thank you. Looking forward to the discussion. Rika, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I, I think uh, one of the many great things about this book is, you know, to use the famous 1968 slogan, the personal is political, and you, you both, uh, Lorenzo and you, have found ways in which you inter intertwine very finely the, the story of, of the, as you say, the humble beginnings in, in Islington, I believe, um, uh, of how your activism through friendship uh, became very important. A, a note that touched me very, very closely was your reference to Utopia and to William Morris um, uh, my, my, my late friend and, and Chantal's uh, Miguel Abensur has written very eloquently about uh, William Morris, uh, not so much in, in this aspect of presenting a future, but what it means to think, as you say in the book, about this passion of something different, of something that's out there, not necessarily realizing that it can happen tomorrow, but it's this energy, this utopian energy, and I think that comes out very strongly. Uh, before I open the floor to uh, the, the audience here, um, we do have colleagues of um, Nicolo who are part of a caravan uh, for Europe, who are traveling by train to numerous European capitals to spread the quote-unquote uh, civic gospel uh, of, of a, a different Europe, of a possible different Europe and who have met uh, hundreds uh, of Europeans. So I would like to give them the floor briefly to tell us maybe each one uh, story that has struck them as they have traveled from Berlin uh, to Vienna through different places. So um, go ahead, yeah, take, take turns. <laughs> yeah, we need the microphone. Yeah. And do present yourself, please. 
I'm Georg, I'm part of uh, the Trans Europa Caravans 2019 and I'm originally from Poland, born in Dansk and living in Germany in Cologne. And um, <coughs> as we are traveling now since 10 days and our journey is going to Budapest and it will end there on Saturday, one striking experience, which you say, uh, oh, you are also talking on citizenship and especially on active citizenship, is the question that we were, for example, in Friedrichshafen at the Bodensee uh, at the Fridays for Future demonstration, where we met 120 activists. What is not that much, you know, for a demonstration, but it was. Uh, compared to many other gatherings or events we uh, we joined, such an energetic atmosphere of activism we have never ever experienced in any other spot. And I think that at the same time we were, for example, yesterday in Salzburg, in an, one of those events on EU elections and why we should vote, and nobody is really able to answer this question, to be honest. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it seems to be very difficult and where we see that there is some kind of an intergenerational debate missing on what it means to be an active citizen. Perhaps this is a question which, with which each generation has to answer again, but we especially feel it in young people, that there is a lot of question of how can we get active citizens, how can we change politics, and not being patronized by the older generation especially. And how could the older generation support these struggles? Um, yeah, I would like to highlight also this uh, silent activist. Ah, yeah. Uh, my name is Katarzyna. Uh, I'm also coming from Poland and living in Poland. Um, yeah, and I would like to also highlight this uh, kind of uh, silent activism. Uh, we met... Um, Solange in Munich, in, at the university in Munich, uh, and she's this uh, silent kind of activist who's uh, every um, time um, coming to the university to put white rose uh, in the uh, place of monument um, of um, yeah white rose uh, activists. Um, so I think that also this story um, with the lady that we um, yeah asked questions to, and sh she was. Um, so um, so kind, so gentle, and uh, also so um, like she was going there every year, and she was remembering the story of um, those who uh, who lost their lives there. So this kind of silent activism is also very um, important for me. That not always you have to join the the big group of people. Not always you have to uh, to go to demonstration, but also by um, doing something very consistently, you can also show the others that uh, you really care. So that would be my highlight. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Lia, I was born in the Netherlands, but I have like Hungarian-Romanian roots as well. Nowadays I also live in Poland, so very interesting route from all of us, I think. Um, yeah, like in on the caravans, um, what I find an, found an interesting moment, um, we were planning like uh, obviously a lot of our stops, of our uh, meetings, uh, but there was one moment I recall very clearly when we were like driving to our accommodation in, in the evening and it was already late and we just were desperate to find some food somewhere in the mountains in Austria. And then we came to this little pizza place and, and somehow it happened that while we were waiting for the pizza, um, the owners, the, they, they were two uh, young people actually working in the, in the restaurant. Um, they started, we started to talk together about the project, we explained about the caravans, what we were doing, and somehow like something, like I saw a twinkling in the eye, like when we were talking about these topics, and especially um, one of them mentioned like, yeah, like it's very clear to us that, that we are from Kurdistan and we are also citizens of nowhere, and they, this is exactly what they said then in, in Austrian, and this is something that's, yeah, even it was unplanned, like uh, this is what stuck with me the most, that um, yeah, you, you, can, you can find this everywhere nowadays. And that's also, in some sense, I found this a very beautiful moment. And 
I'm actually happy that we didn't even report it because now it's like a, a beautiful anecdote, anecdote that we can carry with us. So that's what I would like to share with you. Thank you. Okay. And finally. Hello, um, my name is Irene. I'm from Italy and uh, uh, in the uh, central eastern route of Trans Europa caravans, I am dealing with communications. Um, as it's extremely essential to communicate about what we're doing in order to maximize our impact uh, as well. Um, what I can say I found uh, among the most striking things for me is that in the end uh, we just got to know each other as team members uh, right before we left. Uh, we had a couple of appointments to set up the, the whole thing because of course it was essential to do some planning. Uh, which was also very intense, uh, but uh, in the end, I think the mm, one of the best things about uh, about this project about Trans Europa Caravans is that uh, really uh, we are the best representatives in this sense. I don't mean we, but also the, the 20 activists uh, as a whole um, of what cooperative uh, of what a co cooperative approach. Uh, beyond borders means and beyond mm, our personal differences, our, um, our cultural differences, uh, what, what these that these differences can be overcome in, um, in a very constructive way and it's, uh, that it's actually very easy to get to work together. Uh, not only because we're young, not only because we are, we're all very excited and, and believe uh, very much in what Trans Europa Caravans means, um, but also because, uh, because yeah, uh, young people especially, I think, uh, are, have an essential role in, what, in making what the Europe of tomorrow will look like. And I think we have seen this also um, in the places we have visited so far, in the places we're going to travel to. Uh, so yeah, I would say this is one of the things that I'm keeping the most and that I, that I have learned the most. I've had the confirmation once again uh, of how important this is. Okay, thank you very much. And of course, th all this is, is happening as we're all well aware of, of the impending European parliamentary elections that are in a few days time and where we all expect that there, one, there will be somewhat more participation there was than was in the past. And of course, we're all expecting uh, to see what comes out of it. Uh, undoubtedly a rise of the vote for the far right, but also uh, the fact that this will not be the main story, or hopefully some of us will help not make it the main story, but the fact that the others uh, will keep a majority, a more pluralistic uh, composition of that parliament. But without um, uh, going any further, I'd like to now open it uh, to uh, questions and comments from the audience. And do please introduce yourselves as you ask a question or, or give a comment. L Louisa and then the gentleman. Well, let's start with the gentleman back at the back. Thank you very much. My name is Alec Taylor, and I have the pleasure to mention an initiative that started here in Austria, uh, an Austrian called Nicholas Entrup, and a German who lives here uh, called Michael Hartl, and they've started a movement called Love You EU. It's a website, and you can find it at love-u.eu. And they're making progress, and many of us are trying to support them any way we can. So if you think it's helpful, maybe the caravan would like to um, get on the website and get going. But I think it's very welcome. And just to finish, I'm Irish. I live in this city, and I'm very proud to. But I also have a house in the north of Portugal. And I couldn't have imagined at this age of my life, I'm 77, that I'd be so lucky as to be a European living in the way that I am. So congratulations to everybody who's working so hard and to the caravan especially, and Niccolo. Um, the friendship between Nicholas Entrup and his friend Michiel echoes your friendship with your colleague. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, down here to, to Louisa. 
Thank you so much for your presentation. So my name is Luisa Biosiewicz and I'm a geographer and professor of European governance in Amsterdam actually, but a guest here at the EVM. And I wanted to kind of take up both of you on this question of reclaiming the local and maybe even reclaiming a word like Heimat in its various iterations in different European languages. Um, because I think it's really important, um, you know, kind of not just conceptually, but also politically, thinking about the ways in which the citizenship discourse has been captured by the right, um, whether through this idea of, you know, a people's Europe, which of course is not a people's Europe. I mean, the, the people they imagine is a very particular people that plays exactly with the kind of tension that you identify. So between the particular and the universal, and you know, in most of these understandings, arguing that the particular, so the local, the national, has somehow been sacrificed in the European project, the way at which, you know, the ways in which it has developed, it has been sacrificed to the universal, which of course, you know, is a very problematic construction. But how do we work against that? Okay, back. Lawrence, you want to? Mm -hmm. um, maybe, maybe I do it this way around. One, one of the, I presented the book in, in, in the UK several times because it came out in, in, in British, uh, in English last, last year. Um, and I was struck by um, what, the part of the book that resonated the most, particularly with young people, because um, it was a part that we wrote extremely quickly towards the end of the book. It's the biography of Ursula Hirschman. Um, who, uh, brother to Alfred Hirschman, was born in, in Berlin, um, tried to, to resist uh, the emergence of fascism in, in Berlin, realized that it wasn't possible, also of Jewish origin, goes to Trieste, joins the Italian uh, resistance, um, ends up being imprisoned on the island of Ventotene, takes part in drafting the Ventotene Manifesto, so an example of how uh, communist resistance people imprisoned on a nowhere island at a moment in European history where you would think that nothing is possible, were able to dream of something uh, that has inspired plenty of people afterwards. Ursula smuggles, smuggles the, uh, the manifesto off of the island, goes and tries to set up the European Federalist movement right across, across Europe. And she writes, uh, uh, after all of these adventures, and being married to Altiero Spinelli, who then has his march through the, the, the institutions and so on, writes her, her biography, unfinished biography, Noi Senza Patria. Um, this story resonated hugely with uh, young people in particular in Britain at the moment. Um, and I asked myself why. One is that perhaps it's an unknown story. Secondly, it's a story of a founding mother of the European Union. Usually you don't get to hear about them. Um, so this is something that's important. But I think also that in Ursula's story, there is the, she's not only senza patria, she's also not, um, she's also uncertain who she can support and ally herself with. She talks about the betrayal of the German Socialist Party, the German Socialist Democrats, who at the moment when Hitler is emerging say, you know, don't panic, um, you know, stay calm. And she, and she talks about the betrayal of the Communist Party, who don't send any signal to rise up against the... Um, and so she talks about all of these, these betrayals. And I think it is this that resonates very strongly with a young generation, and probably not only in Britain, which feels politically homeless, and to a certain extent politically betrayed. Um, and I don't think that political parties, any of them, are likely to get beyond this... Um, um, en français on dit méfiance, uh, uh, yes, uh, this kind of sense of distrust towards political parties anytime soon. Um, not only because the hurt, I think, is very deep, but also because um, the pretense that the institutions of government on their own, this kind of powerful sovereign institutions will solve all the problems, cannot be seriously maintained. Um, the, the far right would like to pretend that it can, but, I, but they could certainly do a lot better. But I think that there's also a sense that it can't only be about the politicians in the, in the institutions. And that means that it's a responsibility of all of us. And I think the way that you can uh, reclaim words like Heimat 
as the words like citizenship, is by showing that a certain kind of politics, the politics we've been experiencing, undermines our collective capacity to work together because it destroys the social fabric on which that relies, it destroys institutions of education, um, it criminalizes our working to help with the migrant that we meet in the street, um, it undermines this collective capacity. And we need to have an emancipatory politics which empowers that collective capacity. Um, first of all, oh, where do I start? Um, thanks for this, this uh, Love You Europe, that, that project that's going on. And, and I also wanted to say thank you for doing this caravan. And I'm, I mean, I've been following well, elections, European elections for almost 20 years. And I think this time there's really lots of initiatives like that. And we know some also happened before, but there was also one similar to yours, but on bicycles. I took part in the party around yeah. Vienna and so on. And, and lots of different citizens' initiatives were young, mostly young people, some older ones as well, say that we have to do something in order to get people to think about why it is important to vote. And I really wanted to get back to you because you said nobody can explain to you why you should vote. Is that really the case? Because, I mean, I would have a very simple <laughs> suggestion, <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> I usually do that when I talk to, I don't know, students or whatever. Because I, I give, the, especially for the European Parliament, I give the example that they're really, you can have one vote up or down to make things work or not. And I give that one example going to a bit more local, but that I always give where we lost one vote because of one vote missing to have it positive, it was in 2014. Um, uh, and uh, going to that, that in the European Parliament really, I mean it's not if, if you vote for one or the other, mm, but it, even in, in democratic countries you can have the seat of one parliamentarian depend on one, two or three votes. <coughs> so yes, you can have an influence on that. But this one, and then the <coughs> mandates and the seats in the European <coughs> Parliament, which in many parts is different to many of the national parliaments. I mean, I know the best, know best is the Austrian one, where you have government parties uh, sort of usually voting together, and then you have opposition parties. Hardly anything is negotiated among all the parties. Usually the government parties, everybody votes in favor of theirs. So th usually you know how the votes go. In the European Parliament, that's not the case. In every, every vote, every amendment you have, you have to struggle to get the majorities you want. Yeah? And you can even reach that sometimes coming from the smaller groups. Um, and this one case I usually explain is, was in 2014. And there was a, a, a law on Europe, um, environmental impact assessment. And we had, it was my little group, Greens, we had proposed an amendment that says every time a nuclear power plant that none of us likes, but they exist, so any time there is nuclear power plants and a new block is planned to be built, there has to be an environmental impact assessment before. This vote went 311 to 311, and we lost it because it was one vote missing to go. Yeah? So this is an example where, yes, every vote counts. And that's why it is, I, I, I mean, I, that's usually the explanation I give. I don't know whether that's, that's an explanation that counts for you or which other explanation you would have. But And sorry to get into these details, but I found that interesting in the way that you said this is not something that you had that was explained. Um, and, and the other, maybe another Re part that you, your question. Reclaiming Heimat. Yeah, Heimat. And, this, and you said this reclaiming the local. That I find, and I have been doing mostly, I mean, foreign affairs <coughs> and international relations, which is <laughs> more difficult even that to, to get it to the local level. But the other part that, for example, I've been working with is the LGBTI issue. I'm, I'm being a lesbian myself, and the first one openly in Austria more than 20 years ago gave me quite a clout there. And there I really had the impression that this is something where people are concerned when it gets to discrimination. That's the same like for Roma issues, for all kinds of minorities. Yeah? That there, yes, laws and then uh, the ways they're implemented, that changes something for people at the local level. And European laws on that have improved lots of people's lives. Not everything, yeah, not, not, but there is something that I think that that works. And I think this is essential. And this is not easy. I mean, now talking as a politician, uh, 
This is not easy because very often, especially at the European level, when you explain how the money that comes from the uh, structural funds or the regional funds, then how it, first of all, how the discussions go and then how much budget there is in it and how it gets somewhere to a, a council member in a small village somewhere. And then does the money really end up there or is it lost on the way somewhere? <laughs> This, this, this is the big challenge. And the other thing with the Heimat and the, and the, um, and the, the, uh, no, the, um, what was it, the, the, the that's also the, the terminology, the, the, like the people, when the, 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 these right-wing populists and extremists talk about we are the people, yeah. I mean, they never, it, it's like, and in German you have then the term Völkisch, which is exactly, which is the ethnically defined people insinuating that everybody has, has to think the same yeah, and has to, and they do it for everybody. I mean, to undo that, it really, I think it takes lots of discussions, debates, explanations, also, and not just the, the technicalities, but it means explaining that the differences and the diversity is a richness and not a threat. Because I think their big part starts in the fears that some of them have been, this, this kind of talking about we are the people, meaning the non-white ones, the non-German speaking ones here, or in Italy, the non-Italian speakers, I guess, or in, uh, or in, in the UK, the, the, the Poles that came for helping to, Build better um, uh, not bathrooms and whatever. The, what's it? The, the, the plumbers. The plumbers. The plumbers. Yeah. <laughs> so they all they, they they endanger us. Yeah. And this this kind of creation of a people, which um, I think that in a way has to be has to be broken up. Yeah. And explain and and make people see the, the differences among them in a positive sense. Yeah. Uh, this is a challenge. I, I mean, I don't have the solutions for that, but it is something that that will need to be done by, uh, and and n n let alone by politicians, by politicians as well, but especially by citizens. I think in every debate that I think you have, there's in many families there are debates about that, and I also know it's not always easy to all the time mention and talk about it. Sometimes you just at least I want to have a rest of pol from politics. <laughs> But I think if we want to really go towards the utopia of a, of a common, of a, of a Europe that citizens believe in and trust, not everybody, yeah? it, it's not like never everybody will trust everyone, that's, that's an illusion. But at least for the, for the majority, it, for the big majority, it's something where people say, okay, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's good, yeah? it, it, it helps to make us, be able to have a, a good life for us and for our children and for our community and, and for the ones who live here. Uh, and that means struggles and that means discussions, that means difficult debates, that means also, yes, sometimes, as, as you said before, uh, realizing that even among friends you don't have the same, you, you, you differ on essential issues. And then how do you deal with that? Will you still be friends? I think this is this is also very personal in that sense, very local, because without that sense of, even if you differ on essential issues, is there still common ground for us? Without that, it will not be possible to create at least the, the, the vision of an utopia and then also the way there, because we and that, that's the positive thing. We don't agree on everything. Luckily, I mean, imagine we all were the same and we all agreed on everything. I mean, this would be awfully boring. Yeah. Marina. Hello, uh, my name is Marina Lalovic. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm very curious to read the book. I uh, had the possibility to, to, to meet Lorenzo Marsili in Rome. I'm uh, Serbian, but I, I have been living for 18 years now in Italy, so I'm kind of, as you said, bef uh, between you two. Um, I, am, I just wanted to share with you a bit of what was my caravan in the last two weeks, just like very modestly, because I was very striked and I really uh, follow uh, every EU initiative in terms, both from the professional and personal uh, point of view, because I'm working on a radio in Italy, 
Radio 3, and we had the program completely, um, um, which completely was dedicated to the European Union. It, the name of the program was Radio 3 Europa. But we had a great challenge, uh, and I, my question is, uh, goes really towards on communicating Europe. I was really um, struck by, struck, I was influenced by your uh, sentence, different interpretations of Europe. So I, I will have just two divisions of how do we communicate Europe and whether communi communicating Europe is the only uh, problem we have here. Uh, with regards to a caravan, I had two weeks in the Balkans. I started from Srebrenica, Banja Luka, and I finished in Kosovo. I know that the comparison is not very appropriate, uh, of course, with your caravan, but really my, um, my comment with the colleague of mine while we were doing this caravan was, we really should organize a caravan in this territory in order to uh, you know, convince the people why <laughs> Europe is important. I'm, I know that maybe this might sound uh, rhetorical and maybe utopian, uh, but if you really put your boots on the ground and you cross all this and you have to come back uh, from one borderline towards another because you don't have a green card and you hadn't had paid something, then you realize that the freedom of movement is just a really a small detail of a complication of a scenario which we uh, had the possibility um, uh, to encounter. That is just modestly uh, sharing my experience uh, from one side. From the other side, uh, with regards to communicating Europe, uh, one consideration in Poland, for instance, I was always wondering, uh, Poland is, for instance, uh, the mostly pro-European country, I don't know, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, considering the polls, uh, you have uh, like 70% of people who are pro-European, but we have a right-wing oriented uh, parties uh, uh, there and the most of the communication towards being uh, integrated, uh, towards integrated Europe, we have to deal with uh, Visegrad countries. So you have this kind of a dichotomy to, to struggle with. So I wanted to ask you in your 10 years career of political uh, involvement, how you managed not to preach the converted, which I really think that is the most uh, uh, important thing right now. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm ironic and I may be maybe sarcastic in towards maybe positive uh, explaining Europe because we were dealing with that. I'm a journalist, radio journalist. We were dealing with uh, explaining what is Europe we, uh, inside and outside uh, offices of Brussels. But at the end, it was sorry for saying that it was it was boring and uh, and the listeners were really uh, not listening. We we don't have any more that uh, radio show. I'm so I'm not sorry, but um, I'm, I'm sorry because we don't have it. But on the other on the side, we we maybe learned that maybe we failed in communicating Europe. So my question is whether this is a just an issue of communicating Europe, of just preaching the converted, or, or how did you broke that iron? Uh, let's say, curtain of not just preaching the converted, because I'm afraid we are doing that for a long, long time. I'm really afraid of that. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, thanks for the question. I think that um, preaching to the converted uh, sounds like it's a negative thing, and, and I guess it is mo most of the time, but it also depends exactly what you say to the converted. Um, and I think that it, it's not nothing to try to persuade people who might be already active on European affairs to do things in a different way. Uh, it's becoming easier to make that point because the way things are currently done is manifestly failing uh, um, to, to, to most people. And I think that um, success of European Alternatives discourse to that audience has been about uh, the importance of European citizenship and the political implications of European citizenship, the centrality of politics to a potentially successful European Union. So um, I'm happy to say that we've, pre preached to the con we've, pre we've been preaching to the converted when it comes to that. Then second, um, technique that we have used is to try to mix audiences. Uh, 
um, and to mix collaborators. And so European Alternatives from the beginning has been interested in, for example, trying to work with cultural actors and trade union activists and people working on the environment um, who may typically be active they're all active, but active in very different ways and in different um, domains. And to bring them together and say one of the meanings of Europe is you collaborating on a more holistic vision of change than your specific area um, of change. We had many people asking European alternatives at the, at the beginning, why don't you guys just specialize on migrant rights or on the environment or on LGBT rights? And we, we kept on wanting to say, but there are already organizations doing pretty good, way, good work on each of those individual areas. What we want to do is to try to bring people together in a, in, in a more holistic picture of, of, of systemic change. So that's the second uh, answer. Third answer is uh, we've tried to go to them. We have caravans which drive to towns which never have any discussion about politics, whether it be local politics, national politics, or European politics. No discussion which is formalized. Of course, they discuss amongst themselves political issues. But no one goes to them and asks their opinions on uh, politics. And so some of the most passionate experiences of, of our caravans and our other kinds of activities have been going to such towns, setting up a tent in the middle of the town and saying, hey, we're here to discuss. Um, uh, the political situation with you. So going to them. Um, and then the last uh, answer would be that there are, to my mind, very big issues um, um, which the European Union should be dealing with, but very few people um, make the effort of discussing with the people concerned. The one that is uppermost in my mind right at the moment, because I'm working on it now, is uh, discussing the... Um, social and labor rights of precarious workers, particularly young precarious workers. You've got young mobile Europeans who go into all forms of precarious work, whether it be plumbers or Uber drivers or uh, working in a marketing agency with a very precarious or radio journalists, um, <laughs> who uh, are, you know, uh, the part of the European generation um, taking, taking advantage in a certain way of the opportunities offered by the European Union, but in highly vulnerable um, working conditions. And one of the things the European Union should be doing, and European political parties should be doing, and European activists should be doing, is talking with those people, organizing those people about the ways in which they could fight for and eventually obtain um, greater, greater rights at a European level. So that's, that's four attempts at answering your question. May I maybe add, add one, one thing? Because I often have that feeling as well that usually you, people say, oh, yes, we agree and so on. But there's a difference in just preaching to the converted and then mobilizing them for action, for, I mean, even signing up petitions, which now is easy on the internet. You get probably, you also get all kinds of ones every day that <laughs> you <laughs> decide to sign up. And they, 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 it helps pressurizing politicians, yeah? <laughs> lobbying them in a, in a positive way. But for me, it's not just, there's, I mean, in, in the spectrum that we have, of, when you look at, at citizens, you have, I mean, usually you have maybe, I would, I would say maybe 10, 20% who are really active on a certain issue and who are willing to, to in their free time, to organize around something and do something. It was something more political, not just, I mean, charity is something that, that I think more people do, but that part. And then you have probably about, I don't know, 20, 30 percent by now, looking at who's going to vote for whom at the European elections, who simply think this European Union is nothing we need, it's something that shouldn't be there, and sort of get rid of it in a way. And then there are the others in between, who very often, I mean, most people don't, their everyday life is not about politics, it's not about Europe, it's not only maybe if they have to stop at the border because there's in, the, 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 in Salzburg there's again border, or to Slovenia there's again border controls. That maybe they start thinking about. Apart from that, th there's, for most people, I think there's not that much, they don't have the every, they don't see or feel the everyday influence why they should do something. And I think it's for me, it's for those, for that group. There's the, the really the ones who are, who are connected, who do something, to get them to do something and not just talk about it. 
And then there's the other big part of people where I think many, and I think that's what's happening now with the Fridays for Future, with the young people who, who start, yes, there is a movement and let, let's participate. And I think it's important to also reach those who are, who also sort of are not the ones to discuss very difficult concepts of something, but just sort of see what does it, what's it good for, as you said. What does, the, why, what does it give me? And in that sense, for me, it's even the converted need to be mobilized often and need to not just say, okay, we're going to do something and next day they do something else and forget about it. Sorry to be a bit uh, polemic. <laughs> but it, it, it really needs also energy and commitment in order to get change done. And I think there, yes, there is quite a potential here now for people who, who have decided that they want to also give some of their spare time to, to changes that need to come. Younger ones, but also older ones, I think there is, th that potential is there, and I think this has to be unplugged, or yeah, a lot of plugged maybe to, to connect. Um, in that sense, I don't mind also sometimes preaching to the converted, but there has to be a part in it that says, okay, and what are we gonna do? Yeah? Not just talk about it, write about it, which is important. But then, what are you going to? What are you going to do tomorrow? Are you going to go? I mean, sorry, it's on, on Sunday here in Vienna, two o'clock at Westbahnhof, Oderplatz is the big demonstration for Europe. Yeah, in many parts of of course, demonstrations don't change the world, but they they help to give a, also a, a feeling or an emotion of we're together on something. Lots of people that you don't know. So um, yeah, long words for the thing about that preaching to the converted. It needs something else as well, but it's not, I don't, sometimes it's necessary as well in order to get people to connect also emotionally again that something needs to be done and not just say, okay, we can't do anything anyway. Yeah. This kind of change needs to happen and that's something that you have to connect emotionally to, otherwise it won't work. Um, I would like to ask about the meaning of education uh, because I realized that I actually didn't learn a lot about the European un Union at school, but I thought maybe it's because Poland actually joined the European Union when I was exactly in the middle of my education, so maybe it took a few years to introduce that subject to textbooks and school books, but then I asked my boyfriend who's German and he said he also didn't actually learn about the European Union at school, how it works, how the institutions work and who is who, how it's organized. So I know it's not a huge poll, one poll and one German, but it seems to me that this um, educational element is lacking because you actually don't learn about the whole institution, the organization works, which can create an image of the European Union of s as something very distant and actually not having any actual influence. So how would you um, consider this idea of maybe creating a more unified way of teaching about the European Union already at the school level um, so that children already understand that it's not something completely distant and, and detached from their lives? Let's maybe collect, um, did you want to, to say, yeah, please go ahead. So it's sort of more broadly the issue of civic education. Do we have enough of it and is it the right time? But I would like to resist a bit the, um, the notions of communication and education in the field of politics or activism, that this should, it, it always sounds for me like we just have to find a better way to market the EU, you know, to do a better marketing. But really organizing a political entity of so many member states and so many citizens, organizing is something different than marketing. And it's this, I appreciate this point about education and uh, communication, because I think it's, it's important. But what do we com communicate? What do we teach people? Um, this is always, for me, it's, it's, it's this liberal narrative of if the people were just so smart like us, then everything would be fine. I uh, very often experience this and, I, it, and the same people very often are not active in any way at the same time themselves. You know, those people who, who wait for others to be active and who don't want to preach 
to the converted all the time are at the same time not active and often very scared of ordinary people, you know, who have ordinary life problems in their daily lives and who would like Europe to be a source of solutions for their uh, problems, but who don't see it and it won't change if we just communicate it better. Anyone else? Yeah, thank you. I'm Zofia. Uh, I'm a junior fellow here at the Institute. Could you and just speak up? Please? Yes, sure. Um, I have a question about what you just uh, what just popped out in, in one of your sentences. Maybe it's not the main topic of, of the book, but you said something about the temporality and the, the differences in temporary, uh, temporality in, in Europe in different places, in different regions, I guess. Um, but uh, I also experienced in, in Poland while doing my research uh, different temporalities among different uh, working groups. And um, very many times this, um, like telling about, telling someone that he is stuck in the past is uh, kind of a, um, a very like often um, an insult today, right? Because we have this progress thing, and you have to catch up with things. Uh, but so many, also many people feel that they are left behind, and they want to catch up even, but they they, they don't have the tools or um, or education or whatever else. And you were also saying about uh, praising the difference, and like we should um, uh, really. Uh, like uh, keep the, the differences between us and stuff. So, in in concern with this with this temporality differences, would that also be the case for you? Like, how would you uh, embrace the difference in experiencing uh, time and experiencing progress and uh, of different uh, groups, uh, social groups? Um, did you like as a caravan? Did you did you have this? Because I I had this experience while doing my research that the experience of like um, getting to people, like uh, approaching the people that I that I speak with, uh, with it, like in a different temporality, kind of like with a different experience of time. Uh, even in in the way we we speak to them, uh, even if the way of of phrasing our questions, um, or or even in, in our behavior, like, um, and I was just thinking if if you approach this, uh, if you uh, if you see it as a problem uh, in the caravan and in in talking to people and also in your book, and how do you f f uh, find a solution to this? Okay. Back, back to you. Good. I think they're very coherent questions, not only because of the common Polish theme, <laughs> uh, but also that somehow they, 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 they build, on, build on one another. So let me have a go at giving a coherent answer. Um, I think that there's, that there's clearly a dramatic lack of um, political education, informal education. Uh, and it's already bad when it comes to national institutions in most parts of the European Union. It's even worse when it comes to the European Union. Um, you know, if only we would learn one lesson from the Brexit uh, situation, it would be tell people what the European Union is at the youngest age you possibly can, and you would avoid all kinds of misconceptions. Um, so there's a problem in, in formal education. I always um, think that we have to fight for formal education to be as good as possible, but it's ultimately um, um, we're educated in the interests of the powerful. And, and, and uh, I wonder whether the powerful are interested in us understanding how the European Union works. Uh, it, it, it puts an important emphasis on informal education and what happens outside of um, schools on Fridays, for example. Um, the, and I have the impression that um, in terms of political literacy, uh, Europeans are getting worse. Uh, and that's got to do, amongst other things, with the lack of political options. If one compares the situation now with 68, um, the, the, the sophistication of political debate um, seems to me to be weaker. Um, and and there's, 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 there's less um, ideologically charged, uh, but therefore also less 
um, fine uh, political debate than there, than there previously was. Amongst other things, political parties used to have an important role in promoting political literacy. And I think that that role has uh, largely been abandoned. Um, that perhaps leads me to the, to the question of uh, communication. And I share the idea that, um, that sometimes is a very sort of European institution's idea that if only we could all sit down and talk about this, we would come to some agreements. Um, and the important thing is that everybody should be heard and they have the space and time uh, to debate. I think that the danger with, although I support doing all of that, um, I think the danger with such um, deliberative approaches is that they uh, hide um, class conflict and other forms of conflict in the society. Um, and I think that uh, those forms of conflict cannot only express themselves in discursive means. Um, I think that trying to have us expressing them in peaceful means uh, is a different thing than just having them expressed in discursive means. And that means that we perform politics in all kinds of other ways. Uh, including preventing fascists from marching down our streets, to, to take an extreme case, but also locking bosses out of factories, if that's something that's going to work. Um, so so I'm, I'm also hesitant about talking too much in communicative terms. Um, then the difficult question about temporalities of Europe. Um, part of the issue is, of course, we have no common European history. Uh, and so... And so what Europe means in Poland is a different thing than what it means in Germany because there's very different historical trajectories uh, involved in those different, um, in those different countries. Um, and not only that, there's not only national differences, but there's all kinds of differences in our relationship to time based on our uh, occupations. Um, and, and also, perhaps most importantly for the purposes of the book, on our expectations. And that's why the question of utopia is so important. Because um, is, is it a place in, 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 in the future that we will arrive at? Is it a golden age we have left? Is it a relationship with our um, contemporary politics? And it's in, those last, in that last sense that um, we see it as most important. And perhaps, I don't know whether my answer to you will be comprehensible, but I think that my real answer is that we need to have a fragile conception of utopias, or rather a conception of fragile utopias, that we Europeans uh, have experienced too many horrors committed in the name of certainties uh, to be naive enough to believe in a perfect state of politics or society or culture. That doesn't mean that we should abandon all ideals of what society or politics or culture could be, but we need to appreciate that those ideals are fragile, contestable, and that there will be a plurality of them. Um, and that means, and that needs to be our way of uh, treasuring the different temporalities without abandoning um, all of our arms to uh, protest against or contest those that we dislike. Okay. Um, I very much like the first, the last part that you now talked about because I often, I have, sometimes I have the idea, having been in politics or different kinds of politics for many decades, sometimes I have the idea that certain, that there is the belief that if sort of or let's say, the system changed and like we would abolish capitalism everything would be fine which simply i don't believe in yeah maybe there was times when i believed that but i don't anymore so i think this idea that we have to accept that there will not be a perfect ideal utopia this is simply not in my lifetime not in yours this is simply not human it, it wouldn't <laughs> it won't work yeah? it hasn't in the past all the great ideologies that some of us believed in they they when then humans go and put it into place some things are better and some are a lot worse yeah that's true but it it won't be this ideal thing so in that sense there will always be something where some of us will say this is not good and this is really bad and so on. This is part of life, I think, and of societies. So that's one part. Nevertheless, 
Um, now, when, what you said, this thing with the with the marketing and that there's lots of uh, when you communicate and this sometimes in the EU it's like if you commun communicate better, then everything will be fine. That I also don't believe. And yes, sometimes there is this danger. Let's market it better. Not just in politics, everything. Yeah, everything is marketed nowadays. Yeah, then 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 you make better profits, and then you have more people listening or buying, and then it then things go well. But for for the European Union, for me, there's the, there's two parts where I think one thing communication is essential. It's about and information and education in in schools and as early on as possible. Um, because there are certain structures that prevent things from working as they do or not do at the national level, because it's, diff it's structured differently. And yes, there is the case, I don't know who you said it as well, that there are some powerful who don't want people to understand everything. And for me, one of the, the things that really make me every time, it makes me so angry, I'm sorry to say that, we're not, I'm not sorry to say it, but it, it's a fact. When I hear, and we've had the case in Austria just over the last couple of days, yeah? when we hear, and, and sorry to get in the sort of up to date here, the Prime Minister saying that the EU is, there's a craze of, craze of, of <laughs> regulation, and we have to stop that. That by somebody who has been part of the government since 2011, and his party has been in power in this country for 33 years, without a break. This is like, that's exactly those who don't want people to understand that who they vote for at the national level has a say at the European level. And that this Europe is not something far away in Brussels, but this is us. And that for me is where, yes, it's true that education and real information and finding out how it works, the basic things. You don't need to have everything about comitology. And I mean, there's many things not everybody needs to know. <laughs> but the fact that member states, governments are part of every decision that is taken at the EU level. And if they don't want to, they don't have to be there. But they can be there, and usually they're all involved. Sometimes they are votes, and yes, sometimes they lose. But I mean, that's democracy. Sometimes you lose and sometimes you win. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that really is the part where, yes, some do not want everybody to know how it works. And in that sense, for me, it's not just information or marketing or communication. What I find always, and also somebody already said it, and what I mean with this feeling, getting the kind of emotional connection to being European, also means I think every like 15 to 20 year old has to go and spend a week in Brussels and get to know the institutions and the people who work there and how it works. It's not perfect, but my experience is with visitors groups who come, students, but also uh, mostly teachers as well. I would find every teacher would have to do that in during their edu teacher's education, because then they know what they talk about. Yeah? Otherwise, many, if you don't know much, you don't like to talk about something that you don't know. And if you're not, if you're not obliged to have that as part of your, of your, um, of your schedule, of your program, then you, you don't like to talk about it. So this thing, like in, in Austria, that people, the students and, and high school students or, or um, different uh, secondary school students from other parts of Austria usually have to go to Vienna to get to know Vienna, the capital, and the parliament, and uh, whatever. So the same thing should work with, with Brussels. Yeah? So I think that would help to get an emotional connection with it. Um, yeah, I can also get emotional about that, as you see. But yes, it's true. And, and, yeah, and the other thing, it's, a lot is about structure. And I think their information, more information, is so that people understand why things are so complicated at this EU level. And the other one is, of course, content. For sure, politics that have been done, I mean, be it the, the free trade agreements, be it the whole troika on Greece and uh, Spain and Italy, this is like, this shouldn't have happened that way. Yeah? But also there, at least the European Parliament managed to get some things make it a bit better. Yeah? It wasn't it isn't good at the end, yeah? but at least, so it's a, it's a constant struggle. Yeah? Like in life, anyway. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you, you mentioned that, Ulrike, because I was going to mention it, that the uh, Austrian chancellor just two days ago said that you know, we should stop Brussels meddling with our Wiener schnitzel and whatever. Um, it's this constant smoke and mirrors game that they are to blame and we're 
kind of trying to keep the Wiener Schnitzel kind of uh, <laughs> And the the, 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 the I mean, fortress, <laughs> the fortress Austria will defend the Wiener Schnitzel. I mean, it happened with Camembert, with the pasta, with the haggis and so. I mean, this this constant play by, and it's a question of leadership, right? Mm -hmm. are, are we serious? And Ulrike was absolutely right to to highlight that. And I think the problem has been that you know the fair weather Europe that we have had has made it a fact of life, and people don't think about it. And that's why we need to go back to even some elementary things, as as you were both were saying, to explain what it is. And that's where the formal education, I think, plays a role. It's not a panacea, but I think it's about teaching civility and civicness. You know, what does it mean to be? a citizen and what does it mean to have Europe and I think uh, uh, someone uh, mentioned the fact that we have these high supports for Europe everywhere uh, and at the same time we have this sovereignist you know desire oh if only we were on our own if only we took back control if only we were in the cozy intimacy of our folk you know that everything everything would be fine and we're sort of and the book really addresses this this issue you know how do we go against this uh, simply put populist wave uh, which is prompted and i think that's the other thing i like about the book goes to the not to be too marxist about it the socio economic roots of the de totally deregulated financial market that began with the reagan uh, Thatcher revolution. So there's a, there's a there's a very I think good theoretical basis and philosophical to this, but it's not only a kind of personal political story. There's there's a knife weaving of of all these issues. But we've reached uh, the end uh, of of this evening. Uh, thank you again uh, for coming. Uh, as I said, there'll be a number of events. So follow the agenda of the IWM. And uh, finally, please join me in thanking. Uh, Ulrike and Nicolò.